Would you accept? Okay, um, do I need to use the microphone or can everybody hear me? What you say? Yeah, because yeah, I speak kind of loud. Okay, so. Okay, welcome one and all. I am Jonathan, and uh, originally I'm from England, where we have quite little steam trains like this. Okay, this is where I grew up. And uh, I've kind of been moving around Europe. So I spent a bit of time in Spain. Um, last time I came to Japan, I was living in Slovakia. Um, I've moved again. Now, if you notice, Spain begins with an S, and so does Slovakia. Okay, guess what next? Sweden. Okay, so this is where I am now. It's nice and cold. The sea freezes in winter. It's very awesome. So, I work on Perl 6, and today I'd like to tell you a little bit about some of the nice stuff that's been showing up in the Perl 6 world. Some of it built by me, some of it built by others. Now, when I was thinking about what talk to give here this year, I thought back to when I last came to, to speak at Yapsi Asia. It was a few years ago, and I gave a talk called Solved in Perl 6. In this talk, I had lots of two or three line snippets of code showing you how you could take nice, interesting, little, tiny problems and just solve them uh, using nice, idiomatic Perl 6. Well, over the last few years, the implementations have been growing up. The module ecosystem has been growing up. Um, Perl 6 has steadily been sort of maturing and improving. And we're now at the point where we're starting to have modules and a module ecosystem. So what I want to do today is just walk you through some of the modules that I think show Perl 6 in many ways sort of at its best. Um, they take ways that we can use the language and put them to good use to solve a practical problem. So what we will be able to see today is some more sort of realistic code um, sort of in doing slightly larger things. Now, I want to start off by talking about a module called JSON Tiny. And it actually uses Perl 6 in a few interesting ways. Now, the nice thing about talking about JSON Tiny is that it's a module that really does something that's sort of very core to Perl. It's a module that lets us take data and throw it out as JSON, and it lets us get JSON and sort of get it in as data so we can munge it. So it's all about the glue thing. So let's look at how do we get from Perl data structures to JSON. And the way that this works is with multiple dispatch. Now just to introduce this before I go and walk you through the code, multiple dispatch is where you write two subroutines. Here's the familiar sub keyword, okay, just like in Perl 5. We give it a name. You'll notice these two have the same name. Now, in Perl 6, we have, as, as was mentioned this morning, um, a type system that means we can actually start labeling the, the type of this variable. And what it does when we do this is it says, well, this is what, how to double, this is how to do double with an int. Here is how to double with a string. And you can see we're using the familiar multiply and, and string repetition operator. So if I throw in 21, I get the answer, 42. And if I stick in can, then I do the can can. So, <laughs> that was a good groan. <laughs> that was an awful pun. You're welcome. Yeah, very good. It's an awful pun. Actually, you have. Okay, so let's dig into how we use this to do JSON serialization. So, the first thing we'll look at is how do we deal with numbers? Well, JSON can serialize any real number. It might be floating points, it might be. Uh, just an integer. So in that case, all we do is we just take it, and this little tilde around front just stringifies it. Okay, so you can see that if you give this to JSON thing any kind of real number, then it will just turn it into the string. Now this colon D is telling us that we expect to get a defined value there. Okay, we, we don't expect to get some, we, we have what we call type objects, which represent the type. And what we're saying here is we expect a real value. Often that distinction doesn't matter, but in this case it really does. So what about Booleans? Well, Booleans are pretty easy because in JSON they just come out as true and false. So we'll just throw out that string. 
Now, strings need a little bit of munging. Because if we get a Perl 6 string, we're going to have to play with it a little bit to turn it into something that JSON considers a valid string. Now, if you're familiar with the TR, okay, this is, this is the method version of it in Perl 6. And what I do is I pass it, it looks kind of confusing, but it's really just an array of strings. And then I say, these are all the things to map it to. So this little arrow sort of just tells you we're mapping it to. Really, it's just a path, okay? So we're going to map the, the sort of quote to an escaped quote. And we're essentially mapping all these to their escapes. Now, that gets us most of the way, but then we have a bit of an issue with Unicode because all the Unicode characters need to also be escaped when they go into JSON. So we do a substitution. So this is a little bit like the, the S of the slashes. Apart from, we don't do it in place. So this is a very Perl 6 thing. We very often sort of build things up out of their results rather than mutating things as we go. So here, this is actually the, the syntax for a character class in Perl 6. And it's a, this minus out here is sort of subtracting from everything. So we're saying everything uh, that isn't in this range of characters needs to be escaped. And then all we do is get the character code and we format it with a backslash u, the hex, and we say colon g. That's, that's just passing an adverb saying do it globally. And there we have it. Positional things, okay. So here we match positional, so that's arrays, lists. We have different kinds of listy things in Perl 6. But they're all positional. So what do we do? Well, JSON wants us to have an opening square bracket and a closing one. Then we just take this positional thing and we map it. What do we map it with? Well, we want to take all of the things in the array and turn them into JSON. Well, we have something to do that. It's this subroutine, this multi-sub called to JSON. So we just specify that and it will just figure it out for all of the different things in the list. It doesn't matter if one's another array and one's a string. It just works. And then we join them with a comma. Last but not least, if we get any kind of undefined value, that is essentially the Perl 6 undef, but we have typed undefs to go with the whole type system thing, then we'll just turn that into a JSON null. And if we get anything else, any other defined value, then what we'll just say is, sorry, we don't know how to serialize something of that type. And that's it. That's a complete Perl 6 data structure to JSON serializer. So that's one direction. Okay, that gets us from Perl 6 data down to, to, to a string of JSON. Granted, I missed the hash case, okay, but it looks very, very much like the, the array one. Now, what about going in the other direction? Well, regexes have always been a, a really big part of, of Perl, and really the, the sort of big step forward in Perl 6 is kind of twofold. It's that we've redone the regex syntax to be a lot more sane, a lot more regular, um, but also you can now leverage your understanding of regexes and step it up quite easily to build grammars. So grammars let us pass complex languages, which would be typically well beyond what we could sensibly or even at all do with regexes. So let's look at how we do JSON. Well, a grammar in Perl 6 is just a kind of package. So we can declare it just like we declare a package in Perl 5. It's just that it gives us a bunch of different defaults. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a rule called top. And just looking at this, you can start to see familiar things. Even if you haven't sort of read Perl 6 before, you can see this looks a little bit like a routine. You, know, you can imagine it saying sub instead over there. But it actually says rule. A rule is basically a kind of method that has regex syntax on the inside. The hat and the dollar are familiar. Okay, start and end of string. The vertical bar is kind of familiar. It's a little bit different, but it doesn't matter right here for this example. So that's alternation. The square brackets have actually changed in meaning. They're not character classes in Perl 6. They're just groupings. So what we're saying is we match an object or an array. And these things in the angle brackets, what they're saying is 
call this other rule. So just like you build up software normally by making calls to other subs, other methods, and so forth, we build up grammars by having rules that make calls to other rules, perhaps recursively. So here is objects and arrays. So let's just take a look through array first down at the bottom, because this is a little easier. So what we expect is to see an opening square bracket and a closing square bracket. And what this little bit of syntax here means is sort of between these two. So it sort of says we, look, we, we match this, and we're looking for this. And between them, we expect to find an array list. And what should an array contain? Well, we know that it should contain zero or more values. The star means exactly what you would imagine. Now, the thing is that those values are actually meant to be comma separated. How do we do that? Well, it turns out that we have got this, this percent thing now, which is kind of saying, do the quantifier, do, do the, this, this star here, the zero or many. But instead of just matching a value, a value, a value, match a value and then a comma, and then a value, and then a comma, and so forth. The pair is fairly similar. So we have the same construction apart from these, these uh, brackets instead. Again, we go in looking for the comma. And what we're doing here is we're just looking for some string, a colon. Note you can just quote stuff inside of here. And then some kind of value. Now, one thing that we might do when we get to the value is we might write a big alternation. Okay, that would be one tempting thing to do. So we could say, it's a true, it's a false, it's null, it's a number, it's a string, and so forth. Now, the problem with alternations is that grammars are really classes. And when you write a class, you want to be able to subclass it and add extra things. And if you have an alternation, how do you add to it? I mean, that, that is a good play. Yeah. It's like having a switch statement, yes. So what we want to do is have a way that we can do better than that and be extensible. And that's what protos are. So these proto tokens, what they're saying is that there's this thing called a value. And we can talk about values in general. And what I'd like to happen is when I try and match a value, what I'm really doing is trying to match any of these different types of thing. So I can look for true or false or null. And this magic sim thing just says whatever's in here. Okay? And you can see that we have value colon sim, and then we give it a name. So we're just categorizing all of these things. And then we might have an object, an array, or a string. So you can see that this is actually going to get recursive. This is where we can go and match nested objects, nested arrays, and so forth. Strings are mostly done with character classes. So let's just take a quick look through this. <coughs> we again use this nice squiggly syntax to say we expect an opening quote and a closing one. Between them, we have a string uh, of some kind, this str thing. And that is anything except the quote, a backslash, a tab, or a new line. And then over here, if it's not one of those, then we expect it to be an escape. And what's in an escape? Well, it's any of those, or it's a Unicode escape, a backslash new, and then some digits. And that X digits is, is for hex digits there. So at this point, we have a grammar that does JSON passing. Now, the one thing that we've got left is how on earth do we get from passing to a Perl 6 data structure? Well, it turns out that's not so bad. What we do is we write what's called an actions class. So what happens with this is every time we hit one of those rules and we succeed it with matching it, then we call one of these methods. And this method gets in this dollar slash variable an object representing what we just matched. So if we just match true, well, it doesn't actually matter what's in here. We should just make keyword to say, in the resulting data structure that we're building up, I want to put a Perl 6 Boolean true. For the number one, all we do is we take what we match, turn it into a string, and then nullify it. The plus in front just says make this into a number. 
This one is a little more interesting because what we actually did, if we go back and look at value, is we call the NOVA rule. Now, that does all of the work. That one will do all the interesting work for figuring out how to turn what we passed into a Peltzig string. So all we do in the actions is we just say, well, take whatever that string matched and see what its action method. This AST thing gets you whatever its action method did for make. So what we end up doing is we go all down this tree passing and as we come back up the tree, we put together this Pulse 6 data structure. So how do we use it all? Well, we make an instance of the actions class. Okay, I just showed you a few examples from it, but they're all sort of fairly similar. And then we make an instance of the grammar. We pass the JSON text with these actions. And what we get out is an object that represents the top of the match. And then we just take out the AST and we're done. And we've turned JSON into, well, a data structure into JSON, and then JSON back into a Perl6 data structure. So that's something that, in a way, is kind of nice. We haven't had much code there. We've been able to use multis. We've used grammars. They've sort of felt very, very natural to us. So what else have we? Perl6 is a fairly extensible language in many ways. And one of the things that we allow you to attach extra information or extra behavior to are declarations. So declarations of classes, of subroutines, and so forth. So when you write an L value subroutine of some kind in Perl 6, you tag it with this isRW thing. Now, this RW is one of the built-in traits, but actually, you as a module writer can add these. So anything after this is, this is a little space where you can add extra traits that can be applied to a subroutine um, or some other kind of class declaration and so forth. Now, one module that makes really nice use of these is native call. Native call provides a trait called is native. Is native is a trait that you put on a subroutine, and it means this subroutine doesn't actually implement the real thing. Instead, I'd like you to load a C library, and when you've loaded that C library, look up the thing with this name, and then it looks at the signature and it figures out how to pass the arguments. So, I'm running Windows here, so let's just take a really small little example. Okay, what does it take to call one of the Windows APIs? This is the one that shows up a message box. Well, all I have to do is use the native call module, and then down here I name with is native user32. That's the DLL, the dynamic library on Windows that we would look up this particular function in. So it's called message box A, and it takes an int 32, a string, a string, and another int. Okay? Now once I've done this, I can just call it. I can just call it like any normal Perl 6 subroutine. So I pass it um, a window handle, where there's none. I pass it a bit of text to show. I pass it a thing to put in the title bar, and some kind of code to say what kind of icon to show. That's it. That is all you need to write to call something from the Windows API. Uh, and it's I can a actually. The yeah? yeah? Okay? Little, little, little. Yeah, let's run it. There it is. Okay? So we can have. Wait, it says OLOL. Oh, it says OLOL. Oh, yeah, okay. I didn't actually. Yeah. You cheated? I cheated? No, no, no. Well, <laughs> I didn't really cheat. I mean, there's a the code. Okay. <laughs> So, slide right. Yeah. No, it was actually maybe try, trying to be less sort of lolly in my slides. Oh. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so the thing is that this works for actually more complex things than this as well. So, we've got a sort of growing ecosystem of modules which use native call. So, 
one really nice example that sort of gives you a sense of the power of this is DBI-ish. This is a Perl 6 sort of small subset of DBI, but it does a lot of the useful things. And we have drivers for SQLite, for MySQL, for PG. Um, and the nice thing is that we haven't written any C. All we've done is use the native call library, and we've just written things like this. Okay? So this is from the libpg. This is for the, for the Postgres library. And we just have declarations that say, well, there's, a, there's this one, this, this, uh, this function. It takes a connection. It takes a statement name. And you can see we actually can set up arrays as well. So we can say we're going to pass an array of strings, an array of ints. So it actually supports passing and returning arrays as well, uh, which sort of greatly extends the sort of things you can do with it. Uh, so this is just a little snippet. And we, we have sort of bindings for, you know, as I said, uh, SQLite and so forth. And it actually also these days supports structures, and it just got support for callbacks. So what we're, yeah, and I didn't actually manage to get this running on Windows, but there is um, a very young in its development, uh, SDL now, which is making use of na native call module. And there's actually a, a little game that you can use your mouse and start clicking around and stuff. Um, so this is a module that is sort of a, it, it's not something so user facing, but it's one that we're using to be able to build up lots and lots of interesting <coughs> stuff. Is it still on top of the FFI? No, because libffi is horrible to build on uh, Windows. It's built on top of DINCOL, which actually is nice. Um, it's got a nicer API, and the maintainers are very friendly. And it builds on all kinds of places. It even builds on the PlayStation. Whoop. Yeah, but the rest of Rakuto doesn't yet. <laughs> <laughs> but when we get around to build Rakuto on PlayStation, which I can't think of any applications for, <laughs> then... <laughs> PlayStation? Hell knows. I don't even know what the PlayStation looks like inside. Um, anyway, what else? Okay, so that's native call. Now, one of the ways native call works is by being able to look at signatures and introspect them and then map them down to a sort of C library binding. Um, we, we actually have quite a lot of these sorts of things in Perl 6. It's kind of called metaprogramming. It's programming where we talk about elements of your program. Now, the class system in Perl 6 implements some kind of meta object protocol. And as well as letting us go and look at classes and say, what methods do they have? What attributes do they have? It lets us change the behavior of them. So what we can do is we can say, well, I don't just want a method call to be normal. I'd like to change what calling a method means. And we have quite a lot of power to do this. We can actually add entire new features. Um, so one of the things I've shown in other talks is, for example, adding aspect orientation to Perl 6 as a module. And it still feels really natural. But today I want to show you a module um, that's actually pretty useful. It's called Grammar Tracer. This is a module that lets us debug grammars. And what it does is it sort of looks at method dispatch. And it says, instead of just calling all of the subrules in the grammar, okay, when I said a, a rule is like a method with regex syntax, it really is a method with regex syntax. And a grammar really is a class. So whenever we had one of those calls in angle brackets, really it was making a method call. So we can customize this, and this is exactly what this module does. It traces exactly what methods we're calling, and the methods we're calling tell us what rules we call. So it looks something like this, okay? And before I show you how it's built, let's go and see it in action. So over here, I have a grammar. This grammar um, is actually matching it's, it's, it's trying to match this text down here, okay? So what I've got is I've got a sales report, so it's got the name of a country, so here's Norway, okay? It's got the name of a city, 
we have some longitude and latitude coordinates, and here we have the number of holidays we sold to this destination. And then what I do at the bottom is I just check if my grammar up here is going to pass it. Now the thing is that when a grammar passes, you get a whole nice tree, and when it doesn't pass, all you get is it just sort of says no, okay? So when I do this, it just comes out and says false. We didn't match. <coughs> now, debugging this could be a bit of a pain, okay? I mean, what we could sort of do is we could go in here and we could say, well, what country does it fail near? So what I'll do is I'll just print out, this is nice, you can just shove bits of code inside any of these rules just by writing a Pulse closure in there. So what I can do is just try and get a sort of report on sort of what countries we see before we fail. So we sort of got down to Russia, okay? So if we sort of go and take a look at the data, um, we can sort of see, well, yeah, there's a problem between Russia and the USA. What's new? <laughs> so, so the thing is, that where is the problem? Okay, it's going to be a real pain trying to find this. So instead of messing around, instead, we'll use grammar tracer. Okay, and then we run this again. Here we go, and we get a nice little tree. So, what's going on here? Well, we can see, now it, you can see it matched the destination. Okay, got this one. It came and tried to match another destination, and then it failed, and then everything failed. Okay, so we can see that it, it tried to match some kind of destination here, and the problem is that if we look at this name, do you know a place in Russia called Ulan? No, it's not called that, okay? If we go and have a look at the data, we can see the problem. The place is called Ulan Ude. So let's look at my name rule, okay? See the problem? <laughs> it's just matching a bunch of word characters. So what I want to do to fix this is we can just match any horizontal white space, some more word characters, maybe. Okay, we try this again. Will it work this time? Well, almost, it got further, okay? So we, we actually matched, we got Ulanude, there's the name, the longitude, the latitude. And the thing that went wrong down here is that we, we couldn't actually do San Francisco. There's something weird about San Francisco. Uh, so, so what's wrong with San Francisco? Well, people are so negative about it. Yeah, well, well, the latitude came out okay, but the longitude is kind of messed. So Francis, Fran San, ah, San Francisco has a weird longitude. Well, actually what's weird about it is that it's negative, because it's in that Western Hemisphere thing, okay? So it turns out that if we look at num, oh yeah, num doesn't try to match negative numbers. Well, we can easily fix that. Okay. Try it again. Oh, I forgot to press enter. And okay, we get all the way to the end and it comes out with truth. So that's grammar tracer. Let's just take a really quick look through the code. So what we do, this is the default implementation of Perl 6 grammars, okay? It's in something that says grammar how. That's how a grammar's working. And what we do is we subclass it, we just inherit from it, and all we're gonna do with our special in sort of subclass version is we're gonna shove it in a special package called export how and we're going to put it in under the key grammar. And this magical package is looked at by anything that uses the module, and it says, I'll replace the meaning of this keyword with this behavior. In there, I'll override find method. <coughs> now, find method takes the object we're trying to find the method for, and the name of the method we want. Then what we'll do is we'll do call same. Call same is like super. It says, call the method in the base class, which is what do we normally do for finding a method? And that returns the normal method we find. Now, there's a few methods we want to ignore, okay? We want to ignore pass, match, 
position from, because they're kind of internal, they're, they're not something we're interested in tracing. So if it's just that, we return the method. Otherwise, we're going to wrap it, okay? We're going to wrap it up in this little closure, and then we're just going to put in some code to output the name of the rule. We're going to call the original method and get the result. We're going to bind it so we don't enforce any context. And then down here, we'll hand back the result. So what we're doing is instead of giving back the method, we're giving back a closure so that when the method is called, we'll be able to put some output before and after. And here's the code that does it. Okay, we maintain an indent. We put the name in bold. We increase the indentation. We call the rule. Afterwards, we check if the match was successful. Okay, if the match was successful, we put the text white on green as a summary, and otherwise we color it white on red. And actually this color comes from another module called term ANSI color. And that's basically it. Okay, and you saw the light demo. So that's all we have to do to build something that can do grammar debugging. It's, it's like 40 lines of code to build something that traces our grammars. Last but not least, Rakuto itself is largely written in Perl 6. The parts that aren't are mostly written in a language called NQP, which stands for not quite Perl 6. It's a small subset of Perl 6 that's easier to implement, easier to optimize, and so forth. Because we actually write Perl 6 in Perl 6, it's therefore possible to extend the implementation in various ways by writing more Perl 6 code. So it's very easy to sort of go and hack on and extend the compiler. So earlier this year, um, I started working on a secret project. I unveiled it at Gap to Europe. And what I did is I built a debugger, a Perl 6 debugger for Rakuto. The debugger is written, just a small core in NQP, and the rest of the code is in Perl 6, just as a module. So here we're actually able to go and extend even the compiler by writing Perl 6 code. I think that's kind of neat. So it supports single stepping, breakpoints, evaluation, changing variables, and so forth. And I think the best way to demo this is, of course, with a live demo, which always goes wrong. Okay, so, so I have a program, and let's actually, before we go and run it, let's just talk about it a bit. So I like beer, and then what I did is I, I'm making a little uh, survey here, a little poll, okay, to see what type of beer is most possible. So do we like stout, lager, Fortner, ales, ale, pilsner, and so on, okay? So these are the different types of drink. And what I'm going to do, I haven't voted for anything yet, but I want to put out a result graph. And the result graph will just show all zeros at the moment, because we didn't make any votes. Okay? So I'm using a module called Pulse Simple. Well, Pulse Simple is fairly simple itself. Okay? You can see up here, we won't go too deeply into this code, but it takes a bunch of options, it keeps track of the scores in a hash. So you can sort of see what's going on. When we vote, we check if the option is equal to any of the valid options, I'm using junctions here. Is that 10 minutes? Oh, that's fine. And then what we do is we just increment the count over here. And if it's not a valid option, we throw an exception and so forth. Now the result graph is actually rendered by another module called text bar graph. And it looks like this. So just to go through it quickly, it takes some data. What it does is it figures out how wide the label will be, how wide the bar of the graph will be. It figures out the, the maximum value okay, for, that we have in our data. And then down here, it just maps this hash by the key and value. So it takes each key and value. And it'll just draw a bar graph, a little textual bar graph there. Now, I have a slight problem with my program because I wrote it, um, and when I run it, then I get a, a divide by zero error, which is kind of sad. Um, so I figure we should debug this. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, instead of running Perl 6, I'll run Perl 6 debug. 
And what it does is it tells me what module it loads. And then it drops me in here and it highlights in yellow the statement that it's currently stopped at. So that's that first statement there. And if I just hit enter, then what it does is it takes me into this build sub method, okay, which is just storing away these options and just setting a zero in the, in the scores for each of them. Then we're back here to render the graph, okay? And I can just sort of step through this. So if I run this, just, just run it to the end, <coughs> then I come out with some kind of exception here, okay? So it turns red and that means something is bad. And I can see max value here is gonna be zero. Okay, and I might wonder why it's zero, so I might look at the data, and I can see that the data is all zeros as well. So I can start to sort of pick apart sort of what might have gone wrong here, okay? That really, if we go back to the code, I'm taking the maximum value, but if it's zero, well, really I should actually take one in there. So if we try this again, okay, then it prints out this graph. And if we go and just add a, a couple of votes, so if we just, just vote, let's vote for stout, because that's awesome, okay? In fact, we'll vote for that three times. <laughs> we'll, we'll vote for ale, because that's pretty okay as well, okay? So if I do this again, okay, we start getting a graph. Now, the, pro the thing that annoys me about this graph is there's loads of wasted space here, and I was doing all a load of hard mathematics that hurt my head to try and avoid that. So let's go and visit it in the debugger again and see what's going on. So when I run this this time, I can't kind of be bothered to step through all the things. So what I'll do is I'll just add a breakpoint at bar graph line five, okay? And we'll just run it. So we end up here. So here's where it's doing the calculation. And you can see that it's going to figure out the width of the label by looking at the minimum of two things. So either the limit or the maximum length of the label. So if I run that line, okay, and I just look at the, the number of characters in the label, it comes out as 25. Now that's a bit of a surprise because if I look at my data, then actually I can see that, yeah, they're all rather shorter than 25. What's gone wrong? Well, let's just start sort of picking apart that expression. So here's the data keys. And if we do the max by the number of characters, ah, and here we see our problem, okay? It's giving us the maximum string, but we actually wanted the number of characters. So if I do this, Okay, then, yep, that kind of works. So I know that's what I want, and what I might do is I might actually just sort of say, well, why don't we, we sort of see if we can, we can sort of clear this up a bit. Um, so what I might do, for example, is I might actually just say, get all of the character lengths, and then call max on those. Does that give me the same result? Yes, it does, and it's a bit neater. And then, just to test that my fix works, okay, the debugger even lets me go and assign to the variable. I can run my program again, okay, and this time it got it right. So we're actually able to even change values as we're debugging. So that's kind of about all I have, which is a good job because we're at the end. So, if you want to install modules, there's a native call thing, okay? That's how you install things, a uh, uh, panda thing, sorry. Um, this is the module installer. I don't have time to talk about it anymore, but it's named after pandas, so it must be awesome. Um, I'll just finish up with a couple of links, okay? So, all of our modules are on modulesperl6.org. Um, if you want to play with the debugger, it actually just regex debugging and other stuff as well. It's pretty nice. Um, it's in the Rakuto star releases. That's the easiest way to get it. Just grab one of those from Rakuto.org. Um, so we've kind of finished the age of these little snippets of Perl6 and that look cute now. And we're, we're at the point where we're starting to have some interesting modules. Um, and I think that's kind of nice. And of course, the next thing that I kind of hope we'll see 
is people starting to build implementations of various applications in Perl 6, not just modules. And of course, that's going to take continued improvement in implementation, um, which is what kind of happened to get us to where we are now, um, and what I'm quite comfortable is going to be happening in, in the months and years to come. So, thanks very much, and uh, yeah. I don't think I have time for questions, but catch me, I'll be around the, the next couple of days. あの、英語のえっと、助けてくれる人は僕と一緒に呼んでくれば